Welcome back to Three Minute Tales. This is the She Bean and I'm your storyteller Shanna Key. Now today's story is a heartwarming one. It was sent in to me by an old friend of the channel, John Kelleher. He emailed me a number of weeks ago and unfortunately because I've been so busy, I've just got round to finishing it today. So I'm going to share it with you. I'm not going to go into too much detail. All I'll say that hang on till the end. It's a really, really heartwarming story, as I said, and one of compassion and generosity of spirit. Don't forget, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you want to comment on it, you can do so down below. And as I keep saying, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and the little notification bell, please do so. It's vitally important to us and we appreciate each and every one of you. So until the next time, thanks so much for your time. I'm Shanna Key. Ireland's decision to remain neutral during World War II coupled with the fact that it is an island nation, left the country quite isolated from the rest of Europe with regards to international trade. With the Anglo-Irish trade war still prohibiting the importation of certain goods from Britain, the only way to obtain these essential commodities was through the use of merchant ships sailing from Ireland to Britain and mainland Europe. Due to the obvious dangers of warring battleships and German U-boats, Sailing in open seas was an extremely dangerous task. In fact, during World War II, over 20% of all Irish merchant seamen lost their lives due to their ships being sunk by artillery fire from both German and Allied forces alike. But the perils of this occupation didn't deter some brave and gallant men from pursuing this line of employment. The Wexford Steamship Company, based out of New Ross, had a small fleet of cruisers that were used to run the gauntlet of opposing forces at sea and sail from Ireland to Britain and onwards to Europe to carry essential cargo back to Ireland. These small cruisers were essentially boats whose purpose were to sail along coastal areas and not designed for the open seas. However, these tiny cargo ships, whose hulls were often only a foot above sea level when fully laden with goods, were essential to keeping the Irish people stocked with important foodstuffs throughout the war. Tom Donoghue, a middle-aged Waterford man, was the captain of one of these cruisers. The Kerlog was a 142 foot long cruiser that had a crew of 11 sailors on board. Captain Donoghue had previously had a lucky escape upon another cargo ship, the Irish Oak, that had been attacked and sunk by the Luftwaffe in May 1943. After he took control of the Kerlog, he began regular voyages from Ireland to neutral Portugal to return with essential cargo to various Irish ports. International cargo vessels usually sailed in convoy for safety reasons and at night turned off all their deck lights so not to attract the attention of German U-boats or German aircraft. Irish merchant ships, however, sailed with all deck and mast lights on, with an Irish tricolour clearly painted on the ship's hull and deck. This was to identify themselves as being from a neutral country, in the hope that their vessel would not be attacked. On Wednesday the 29th of December 1943, the Kerlog, which was fully laden with a cargo of oranges on a passage from Lisbon to Dublin, was sailing through huge swells in the choppy waters of the North Atlantic Ocean. Just 380 miles south of Fastnet Rock on the southern tip of Ireland, a crew member upon the Kerlog spotted an approaching German warplane in the distance and alerted Captain Donoghue. Get up on deck, boys, it's the Germans, shouted Donoghue to the rest of the crew. As the men scrambled from beneath the hull and stood terrified on the deck of the ship, they stared in horror as they watched the low-flying bomber draw closer to their vessel. Some of the men began to pray, while others gripped the metal deck railings, their knuckles white with fear, waiting for the imminent sound of machine gun fire. In the event of attack, the drill was for all men to remain on deck with no one inside the vessel, in case it was to capsize, trapping them inside the hull. With the plane now less than 200 yards away, they braced themselves for the inevitable. But just as some of the men closed their eyes in anticipation, the aircraft dipped its wings from side to side and flashed its spotlight repeatedly. The plane circled the Kerlog and flew off in a southwesterly direction. Captain Donoghue knew immediately that this was an SOS call. 
he instructed the engineer to turn the ship around and follow in the direction of the bomber. In the Bay of Biscay, shortly after 11am, the Kerlog finally reached the appalling aftermath of a naval battle between Allied and German forces. A large German destroyer and two German torpedo boats had been sunk by the Allies in the encounter. The sea was littered with over 700 German sailors, debris from the sunken ships, corpses in life jackets and men desperately clinging onto life rafts and pieces of wreckage. The unwritten law of mariners is to always assist other sailors in peril, whether they be friend or foe, and so Captain Dunahoo and his crew began to pull the German sailors on board the Kerlog. The senior German officer, Lieutenant Commander Joachim Quadenfeld, later recounted how he had seen the little ship bravely moving through the enormous waves to pick up more and more of his comrades. For the next 10 hours, the crew managed to pull 168 freezing German sailors on board their tiny cargo ship. First aid was administered to some of the more badly injured sailors, but sadly, four of them passed away while still on board the Kerlog. Due to its tiny size, the Kerlog's entire deck, cabin, galley and storeroom was now packed with German sailors. The tiny cabin of the Kerlog was so full the chief engineer, Englishman Roy Jiggins, had to instruct some of the German sailors to control the instruments as he was unable to get close enough to them to operate. The German commander, Lieutenant Quadenfeld, requested Captain Dunahoo to change course and sail to the French ports of La Rochelle or Brest so to land his men on German occupied soil. But Dunahoo refused and continued to sail to the closest Irish port, which was Cork. With so many Germans on board, it would have been very easy for them to overpower the crew and to take control of the ship. But out of respect for the Irish captain and his gratitude towards his crew, Lieutenant Quadenfeld accepted Dunhu's decision. As the Kerlog sailed past Land's End in Cornwall, a radio broadcast from the British Customs instructed Captain Dunhu to sail to Fishguard in Wales, where the men could be taken as prisoners. However, due to the poor health of some of the sailors, Dunahoo steadfastly refused and sailed onwards to Cork. The Kerlog's cargo of oranges sustained all on board until they reached Irish soil, where most of the men were treated in a Cork hospital. The incredible rescue was barely mentioned by the media, with only a small mention of it in the single paragraph by the Cork Examiner newspaper. After an exhausting and eventful journey, the Kerlog eventually continued to Dublin, where Captain Dunahoo was given a handwritten letter from the German ambassador, Dr. Edward Hempel, which read, To you and your crew, my profound gratitude as well as my high appreciation of unhesitating valiant spirit, which has prompted you to perform this exemplary deed, worthy of the great tradition of Irish gallantry and humanity. However, a German U-boat repaid the Irish by sinking another Irish merchant cargo vessel two weeks later, mistaking it for an Allied vessel. All on board were killed, including a lifelong friend of a crewman of the Kerlog. All 164 surviving sailors were detained at the Curra internment camp in County Kildare until the end of the war before being released. Two of the sailors, Petty Officer Helmut Weiss and Lieutenant Bratz, who died while incarcerated, were buried at the German military cemetery in Glen Cree in County Wicklow. The crew have been quite rightly commemorated over the past 77 years for their bravery, with the last being a service held in Wexford in June 2016 to award the family of the English chief engineer Roy Jiggins a posthumous medal for bravery. The last surviving crew member, Tom O'Neill, visited Germany a number of times as an honoured guest of some of the rescued seamen. His last visit there was to attend the official launch of a yacht owned by one of his hosts. And yes, the yacht was aptly named the Kerlog. <laughs>